Now the vast difference in the blood vessels are necessary additions, of course, and are the intended contents of the newly formed inguinal canal. But the bit of peritoneum that got dragged along through the canal, well, there's no real reason for it to be there. In fact, this bit of peritoneum known as the processus vaginalis normally completely degenerates on its own in infancy. When it doesn't, though, this can lead to some pretty interesting consequences. If a distal portion of the processus remains, it can collect fluid and become humongously enlarged. That's called a hydrocele. It's not dangerous, but the size ranges from insignificant to enormous, and it can be pretty painful and inconvenient having a water balloon the size of a grapefruit in your scrotum. If a proximal portion of the processus vaginalis remains, this can lead to an inguinal hernia. So just like with ephemeral hernia, if an outpouching of peritoneum exists, it means that the bowel can find its way out of the peritoneum and, you guessed it, all the way down into the scrotum if it's persistent enough, which wouldn't ordinarily be a problem, but the inguinal canal is pretty narrow and has a couple of openings in it called rings that are restrictive enough to where, if the bowel gets trapped in front of them, that can lead to some bad complications. The deep ring is an opening in the transversalis fascia where the peritoneum first pokes out into the inguinal canal, and the superficial ring is the opening in the external oblique aponeurosis, just before the scrotum. Both of these are pretty non-compliant and can get a piece of bowel stuck or incarcerated. And if a piece of bowel gets stuck so tightly that its blood supply gets compromised, that's called strangulation. And this, of course, is bad news bears. Because the bowel has a lot of what some call early poop, which is just loaded with the kind of bacteria that you do not want in your abdominal cavity. And as it turns out, necrotic bowel isn't so good at keeping those poop germs inside the gut. A strangulated hernia typically presents with not only local inflammation and pain, but also fever, peritonitis, and sepsis. Now these two complications are pretty easy to remember because they kind of sound like they're common definitions. Incarcerated means imprisoned, like you can't get out. And strangulated is like choked, like you're cutting off someone's oxygen. The type of inguinal hernia I'm talking about now is called the indirect inguinal hernia, which pops out through a defect in the deep ring. It's called indirect because the bowel has to follow the complicated wraparound path of the inguinal canal to reach the scrotum. In contrast, a direct inguinal hernia basically says, forget this, I'm taking a shortcut, and just plows its way through the abdominal wall straight to the weakest spot, the superficial ring. Now, just to be clear, your abdominal muscles have to be pretty weak to let your floppy old intestines just push their way into your groin. So this is generally an issue of age and abdominal wall deconditioning, as opposed to indirect inguinal hernias that can happen at any age. Note about the anatomy of these hernias. Because the inguinal canal takes the roundabout route, it's covered in all three layers of the inguinal canal, whereas the direct hernia is beelined straight for the superficial ring in the external oblique, meaning that they bypass the transversalis and internal oblique and are only covered by external spermatic fascia. The other high-yield anatomic landmark to remember is the inferior epigastric vessels. These run from around the area of the inguinal ligament and run superiorly and medially towards the rectus abdominis. These vessels divide up the hernias nicely as they reliably run just medial to the deep inguinal ring. Therefore, the use is a landmark for hernias. Indirect inguinal hernias emerge lateral to the inferior epigastrics, and direct inguinal hernias emerge medial to the inferior epigastrics. The USMLE loves this one. I don't know why. The eponym for where direct inguinal hernias occur is called Hesselbach's triangle. And the triangle consists of the inferior epigastric vessels, the lateral border of the rectus abdominis, and the inguinal ligament. Finally, it should be specified that both of these tend to happen in males, which should surprise nobody. The fact that the male testes tend to tunnel through the abdomen mean that there are more weak spots for hernias to happen. Indirect inguinal hernias are almost exclusively men, because while females have a gubernaculum that tethers the ovaries to the labia instead of the scrotum, the ovaries stop in the pelvis, meaning there's no processus vaginalis barring some freak accident. Direct inguinal hernias, however, can still happen to women because everyone's abdominal wall gets weaker with age. But it's still more common in men because men have the added weak spot of a superficial ring. The last type of hernia involves the diaphragm, where the gut moves from the abdomen where it's supposed to be, through the diaphragm and into the thorax, which is not so bueno. Now, if you've learned anything about hernias in general, where do they tend to occur? Okay, that was sort of a guess what I'm thinking question, but in general, Hernias tend to occur wherever there's a weak spot. On the majority of the anterior and the right sides, the liver acts as a pretty good barrier between abdominal organs and the diaphragm, so there's not too much herniating over here. All this stuff back here is retroperitoneal, so that's off limits, of course. So, in that remaining segment of the diaphragm, what stands out to you as a potential weak spot? 
You guessed it, my friends, this little hole in the diaphragm right here where the esophagus pops through, otherwise known as the esophageal hiatus. This is the most common location for a diaphragmatic hernia to occur, and this is called a hiatal hernia when it does, which makes sense. Now, normally the esophagus is tethered pretty well to the esophageal hiatus by various ligaments, but laxity of these ligaments is common, and this allows a couple of different flavors of hiatal hernia. The sliding hiatal hernia is simply a laxity issue where the stomach can intermittently pop up through the diaphragm and displace the esophagus upwards. Paraesophageal hernia occurs where there's actually a defect so large that the fundus of the stomach or even a segment of bowel can slip around to the side of the esophagus. Now, sliding hiatal hernias are pretty common, and like directing little hernias get more common with age. Makes sense, right, as both have to do with weakening of connective tissue. But I don't think most people realize exactly how common these hernias are. About 60% of people older than 50 have one of these, making this the most common type of hernia by far. So I can almost hear you guys asking this question. How can we never hear about these? How can we obsess so much over the inguinal region? The reason is because unlike inguinal hernias, where you can actually see a bulge and feel some pain with it, these hernias are almost always asymptomatic, and strangulation as a result of these things is pretty much unheard of. Having your stomach squeezed up above the diaphragm can cause a bit of pressure buildup in that part of the stomach, sure, and because of this, you might get some increase in acid reflux symptoms, but these tend to be very mobile and reduce extremely easily on their own. The problem is with the rarer paraesophageal variety. In this case, the esophagus gets itself squeezed because you're trying to cram two bits of gut into a space where only one is meant to go. This can actually lead to a stricture and a clinically significant dysphagia and may require surgical fixation of the stomach below the diaphragm. It's kind of a cool procedure called a Nissen fundoplication. It's not important for step one, but it's a neat surgery if you want to look it up. Hiatal hernias aren't that big of a deal, but the last two types of diaphragmatic hernia are a lot more serious. The next most common is the traumatic diaphragmatic hernia. This is where you either have a penetrating injury that lacerates the diaphragm, or more commonly, you get a, such a violent blunt trauma to the abdomen that the pressure in your abdominal cavity literally pops a hole in the diaphragm. Again, because the liver's in the way, diaphragmatic hernias usually occur to the left side. And these can cause some pretty large volume herniations, which is bad news bears, because what other important structure takes up space in the thorax? So if the hernia is large volume, you can get respiratory distress from compression of the lung, and these also have a significant risk of strangulation since the bowel is pushed forcefully through the diaphragm. So there's really not a whole lot of choice but to fix these surgically, but if you do, there's a reasonably good prognosis depending on what other injuries the patient has. The last and worst type of diaphragmatic hernia is the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In these kids, the central tendon of the diaphragm which is formed from the embryonic pleuroperitoneal folds, doesn't come together properly and leaves a huge hole for the gut to come through. And the reason this is so bad is that the intestines grow pretty quickly. As you guys already know, they have to herniate outside the body while in utero to get all their growing done. Point being, if the GI tract is given any leeway or extra space to grow, it'll take over like a weed. The lungs, on the other hand, are slow to form and only fully develop by 34 weeks. So that's well into the third trimester. So these guys don't stand a chance against the growing GI tract, and if there's any communication between the thorax and the abdomen, the GI tract will beat the lungs any day of the week. So, kids with congenital diaphragmatic hernias are not only born with a defect in their diaphragms, they're also born with lungs that never properly formed because the intestines took over the thorax before they had a chance to grow. And this, my friends, can be a fatal consequence, not only because the newborns have a huge oxygen requirement, but also because a shrunken lung means more resistance in the pulmonary circulation, which can lead to right heart failure. If you're not sure why this is the case, review the section on pulmonary hypertension in the cardiovascular section. These kids with congenital diaphragmatic hernias need emergent surgery, but the reason this is so bad is because even if you fix the hole, you're still stuck with a lung that never had a chance to grow. At best, these kids are looking at a prolonged ICU stay. And that about covers it for hernias as well as for the entire anatomy section. Nice job, guys. And I think you all deserve to treat yourself to a nice, fresh flash quiz. Last hernia question. What defines an inguinal hernia? Go ahead and pause and think about this if you need to. So, a direct inguinal hernia 
unlike an indirect inguinal hernia, doesn't follow the entire path of the spermatic cord through the inguinal canal. It directly pushes its way through the abdominal wall to the weak spot in the superficial ring, and the spot where the direct hernia is emerged from is called Hesselbach's triangle. The rectus abdominis, the inguinal canal, and the inferior epigastric vessels. Other important facts, these hernias are associated with a weakened abdominal wall, usually through age, and are only covered by the outer layer of spermatic fascia. Alright you guys, thanks for sitting through Anatomy with Arjun. Hopefully you all got something out of the animation overload that is this video, because GI Anatomy, while tricky, is very high yield. If you like what you saw, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up down below, or even better, write a comment to let me know what I'm doing right, or what you'd like to see in next year's edition. Until then, Arjun Iyer, signing out.